So I'm once again doing another manga chapter series review that has yet to become an anime. This is another human and beast romance series. And honestly, I was hesitant to read it at first, since not much was known about it at the time, and there weren't any reviews that I saw that mentioned what type of romance series this was. Since in the case of this series, it's set in an office workplace and with adult characters. And sadly from what I've seen in ads, a lot of the time, these types of series tend to start out good, but then quickly devolve into degeneracy. Namely, just become a smut series. And no judgment if that's your thing. But I personally would much rather know beforehand if any series I was going to be reading had this type of 18 plus content in it before purchasing it. To at least give me a chance to see if it solely revolved around the hentai content, or if it actually had a story with character growth. Because I'm not just about to waste my money on smut. I stumbled upon the series randomly, as I do most series honestly, and I believe I saw it in a Facebook ad from Yen Press, and even saw a random YouTube comment mentioning it in an anime video that I was watching. And so I searched it up, and honestly right from the cover art, I was skeptical. I couldn't really gauge anything about the series, and feared it may not be a wholesome series. But fortunately, after thinking about it for weeks, and then seeing the only TikTok video at that time, talking about this series revealing it to be wholesome, and since on that day in particular, I was having a slow day at work, I decided to read it online to pass the time. But since only the first three chapters were online, I could only read up to chapter 3. But by that point, I was already super invested in the story, and I wanted to see what happened next. So against my usual way of doing things, I pre the first volume to be able to read the remaining chapters, to see exactly what direction the story went in, and give it a fair shot. And thus far, I'm really glad I did. And I say as of right now, because who knows what could happen in volume 2 or ahead. Maybe it'll change. Maybe it'll no longer be wholesome. Maybe it'll be super dark. Who knows? That's the mystery of the next volumes. And I did a similar thing with Sacrificial Princess and the King of Beasts. Since considering how it ended with the insinuation that something might have happened between Princess Vivian and His Majesty, I just had to see how that turned out to make sure it wasn't both a harem series and a smut series. I couldn't handle it if it was, so I had to ensure this series stayed true to its initial wholesome and occasionally dark vibes. With this series, the age barrier isn't there to necessarily stop mature things from happening. And although even in certain series, when there is an age barrier, something that does end up going in the mature direction, it isn't too common from what I've seen. And since this series doesn't have that barrier, since both main leads are adults, there's an even greater chance of something mature happening between them. So I'm just trying to make sure that the series is still wholesome for the most part. And on a final note, my commentary for this series will be a bit different than the other ones that I've done previously. Since as I was reading this series, I started to write down my own theories and beliefs of what would happen next. Though I only started doing this for this series in chapter 4. So for the first 3 chapters, the way I say things will be the same. But from chapter 4 and onwards, I'll be saying all the thoughts that I had while I was reading. Since I was basically reacting to the chapters as I was reading them. And I just wrote it down, and I didn't record myself saying anything. Now having said all of that, on to the chapter. This volume starts off with a human woman named Saki Oki having to deal with a difficult boss and environment, and then suddenly being called into the CEO Atlas's office. Atlas asks her if she finds him fearsome, to which she nervously stays silent. And Atlas then says he must frighten her to the point of speechlessness, and that he will have to find a way to deal with her. Saki then slams her hands on his desk, and states that if she's going to be fired, if she admits to fearing him, then she's not afraid of him. And upon hearing her say that, this shocks Atlas. And before Saki can finish her next sentence, he declares that she will be his personal secretary, completely shocking Saki with this news. Atlas then says he only wants to work with capable individuals who will continue to work hard and keep on learning. Atlas then praises her work by saying she has proven herself to be capable multiple times. Though had she stated if she was afraid of him, he would have had to rethink promoting her. He then tells her she starts her new position the following day and extends his hand to her. And when she just stood there staring at him, he then asks if she's afraid of handshakes. Saki says no, and states that she was simply surprised, since no one had ever asked to shake her hand before. This surprises Atlas, and he internally states how starting the next day, he would praise her work a lot. After a prolonged handshake, Saki then nervously asks if he could let go of her hand, and after some pause, Atlas says no, shocking Saki again. We then see the author stating how it would be several years before Saki becomes the ultimate secretary. The following day, as Saki is inputting information on her computer, she internally states how Atlas still hadn't let her hand go the previous day afterwards. And during her prolonged handshake, her co-workers had left her mountains of paperwork for her to do so they could go on a break. She then leans back and drinks from a pouch while thinking about being Alice's personal secretary and how there are many who have been born with reverted genetics. Atlas was one of the few. And this causes him to have overwhelming strength and an intimidating air around him. Such a beast man acknowledged a female human's work. And although this is a huge step up for her, she is unsure if she will be able to endure being in his presence. And how no one here at her current job had ever praised her work before. She then slams her hands onto her desk and states that she will give it her all. We then see Alice in his office, staring at his hand and thinking about his and Saki's handshake the previous day, and clenches his hand shut while switching his tail. While walking with Alice, Saki is annoyed by the comments of the rest of the Beast Folk employees, saying how they thought only people capable of doing their jobs worked for Alice, and how her being a human would only bring him trouble. Saki internally annoyingly apologizes for causing trouble, and how they have a point, since by hiring her, Alice has made a scandalous decision and questions if he is sure about it. 
She has then jolted out of her thoughts by Alice saying her name. He then tells her that when walking with him, she must look straight ahead and who she is now is a culmination of all her past achievements. He then continues to tell her to have confidence in what she has accomplished as she stands by his side. He then cautions her of one thing, that she is surprisingly cute and how people will notice her when she is with him. And before he can finish the sentence, Saki reacts very flustered and tells him how no one has ever called her cute before. We then see an imaginary arrow pierce Alice's heart and he squeezes his chest. He then tells her she should stay with him all day. We then see Saki's former boss annoyed by what he sees. It's now the end of the workday, and Saki states that she has in fact stayed with Alice all day, and once she delivers some paperwork to him, she will be done for the day. One plus side to being with Alice all day is that she now has a grasp of what's expected of her, and she also realized something, that she isn't used to his overwhelming presence yet. Knowing him better now, she's aware that he's a really good boss, but her instincts keep telling her to run. She panics when he comes near her, and flinches if he touches her when she isn't expecting it. She now understands why he asked her if she was afraid of him. But if she can't get used to being around him, then, before Saki can finish her sentence, she is suddenly pulled away by someone and slammed against the wall. It's none other than her former boss, who is annoyed at the fact that she has neglected to train her replacement or thanked him for taking care of her. Where were her manners? Saki apologizes for not personally seeing him, but then goes on to thank him for claiming his subordinate's work as his own. She is then slapped and is told that it's only natural for him to take credit for his subordinate's work and that he was thinking of asking the CEO to return her to him how they all feel intimidated to be around him, and how she probably feels it worse than they do, and that he is sure that she'll want to quit soon. To which Saki replies that that would never happen. Her being there is proof that her skills have been acknowledged for the first time. How she will never let go of her position just because she becomes nervous around Alice, and that she'll never be used by him again. And right as her former boss is about to continue his verbal and physical assault, someone off-screen asks what he's doing. We then switch back to seeing Alice, soon after Saki left his office for some paperwork. He is nervously looking at the clock, as she's been gone for three minutes. Then five minutes. 7 minutes, and finally after 10 minutes have passed, he goes out looking for her, while repeating that Saki had said that she would be right back. This series is definitely a unique one. It's another Beauty and the Beast type series, but instead of the crime of still in a rose keeping them together, it's Saki's new position as Atlas's personal secretary. They were really quick to show us Atlas on the first page. I was really surprised because usually with these type of series, they tend to ease us into the story first by explaining who the main character is, what they do, what type of person the beast man in question is, before actually showing him. Unless it's like a virtual person the King of Beasts, since so his majesty appeared on the cover image of the first manga volume. But really besides that one, this is the first series I've read where right from the first page, we see the beast man love interest. I mean, sure, we see his paw on the cover image, but we actually see him on the very first page, which to me at the very least, as I said previously, isn't very common. We also see that in this world, just like many others, one group is considered superior over another. And in this series, humans are the ones looked down upon, their kind is the minority, where a beast kind is the majority. Character-wise, I enjoyed watching how both Saki and Alice are as individuals. Saki was looked down on for being human, and she was never properly compensated nor recognized for all the hard work she has done, but be that as it may, she doesn't let that get her down. She stands up for herself in a very toxic work environment until she's finally given the recognition that she deserves and is given the job of being none other than the CEO Atlas's personal secretary. Saki is not one to remain quiet when the odds are stacked against her, be it her former boss or when she met Alice for the first time and when she faced the possibility of losing her job. She proclaimed that she was not afraid of Atlas, even though internally she said, what kind of question is that? Of course, the answer is yes. And her stating that she wasn't afraid is something that no one in her old office could ever say. She carries herself with unyielding resolve, and she doesn't care about your rank. If you do something wrong to her, she will defend herself, or she will call you out on it. And what I really liked about her is that she never let her former boss or her fellow co-workers ever make her feel inferior. No matter what they said to her, no matter how they treated her, she never let them get to her. She doesn't feel that her work isn't good enough, nor questions if she's up to the task of being Alice's personal secretary. She knows she's an excellent worker, even though no one has ever praised her for it until Alice did. Especially since she knows that her former boss constantly used her own work and said he did it himself. She knows that she's good at her job. It's just that the fact that she's human, and most likely also because she's a female, is why her former boss doesn't like her. But she knows that he knows that she does her job well regardless of the fact that he has never, nor will he ever, say otherwise. She never doubts her capabilities, nor undermines herself in any way. She continuously stands up for herself and her work, when the environment she's constantly surrounded by pushes the opposite and doubts her work and undermines her for simply being human. When most of the humans would likely not be as strong as she is and take many things personally and doubt their work and think they weren't good enough and question their abilities, she isn't like any of those. She really is a different type of human. Alice, from what we've seen of him so far in this chapter, appears to be an excellent boss. 
He values his employees' work and doesn't discriminate based on race, like many other beastmen in the office do. And he seems to hold Saki in a very high regard, considering that he called her into his office to see if she would be a right fit for the job. And once he received a surprising answer, one that he himself never expected her to say, he immediately gave her the job offer. And we saw that Saki's words still resonated with Atlas the following day, since we saw him squeeze his hand and switch his tail. Clearly, he was more than pleased with Saki. He also seems to want to give Saki what she has been deprived of, which is praise and acknowledgement. And he's genuine about it. He's not doing it necessarily for an ulterior motive, nor to just keep her around to be a secretary. He genuinely believes in praising her work because she does a good job. And since she stated that no one has ever praised her work before, he wants to make sure that she knows she's doing well. He's an awkward beast man, but he has a sweet and kind personality. Since as soon as he heard that Saki had never been praised for her work before, he made sure to praise her work starting the following day. He didn't ignore her words. He actually listened to her and implemented what he knew and decided to make sure that she knew that she was valued by him. He also seems to care greatly about her already, warning her of the attention that she would receive now, now that she is his personal secretary. Also, I can't believe Atlas said that she was cute. Having an idea of how Atlas is and him not seeming to have ulterior motives in saying that, it's a genuine compliment that he doesn't see an issue with since he was saying that in addition to warning her about any attention she would start receiving. But, from a boss and employee perspective, this isn't the best way to start off with your brand new personal secretary. I understand why he said that, and honestly, if I was in Zaki's place, I think I too would be happy to receive just a compliment. But, honestly, I would also maybe be just a little bit skeptical. But regardless, after hearing what he had to say next, it would all make sense to me. And besides that, Saki didn't seem bothered or creeped out by what Alice had said. She only said that Alice had done another thing that she wasn't used to. He told her that she was cute. She wasn't creeped out, she wasn't bothered by it, she was just generally surprised. But honestly, I mean, just look at Alice, he's just so sweet. If he was my boss, I think I would just love to work for him. <laughs> Going by real world standards, if my human boss told me I was cute and I wasn't very comfortable with him yet, I do think that yes, I would be maybe a little bit weirded out and I'd be like, okay, that's different wasn't expecting that how am i supposed to take that but if i were to live in the world that saki does and alice was my boss and he were to tell me that i do think i wouldn't necessarily be as creeped out but only because he has already shown signs before then that one he's awkward and two he doesn't seem to have any malicious intent behind his words he just seems like a genuine man and really i think i'll just leave it at that because again after he called her cute he was saying that in addition to the warning so he was just trying to give her some perspective as to why she should be careful about any attention she might be receiving from now on they both seemed to do for each other what no one else could do alice acknowledged and praised saki for her work and saki was able to speak up for herself and proclaim that she wasn't afraid of alice they each fell in for what the other one was missing and although he wasn't necessarily an as prominent character in this chapter as the other two were with regards to Saki's former boss, at the very least right now, he seems very one-dimensional in his reasoning for not liking Saki. At the very least from what we know, because again, we're just inferring that he doesn't like her because she's a human and also because she's a woman. I don't know if maybe later on we're going to find out that he might have another reasoning for not liking Saki other than maybe just the inherent speciesism that he has right now. Or if it really is just that he just doesn't like her because she's not one of them, a fellow beast folk. So I think it'll be no surprise to anyone who I will be first comparing this series to. This series, of course, reminds me of the manga and anime series, Sacrificial Princess and the King of Beasts. Saki and Sarafi both have an S at the beginning of their names. They are looked down upon for being humans and have to deal with the hostility that the beasts have towards them. They both surprise the beastmen by stating that they are not afraid of them. They both speak their minds and don't let others' opinions of them sway them, except for maybe one instance. Sarafi's being, when Anubis' words swayed her a little into doubting herself of being capable of being by his majesty's side, but she soon overcomes that, and from then on would be able to proclaim that she was the one meant to be with his majesty, and no one else. Which is also similar to Saki. We saw her falter only once and very little at that, when she thought that maybe they were right, maybe she wouldn't be up to the task of being Alice's personal secretary, but of course she quickly overcame that. Both Saki and Sarafi were moved from their lower positions to being put right next to the beastmen in charge due to the fact that they were not afraid of such fearsome beastmen who was used to practically everybody being afraid of them. Yet these small human women showed no fear. Another comparison is, is Belle from the Disney animated film Beauty and the Beast since Belle has to do with the scorn from the villagers and is swayed for a moment by the words when she asks her father if he thinks she's strange and although she was initially frightened by the beast after the beast saves her life from being killed and mauled by wolves and although Belle at that moment was fleeing from the castle after being frightened by the beast and told to get out, she decides to do the right thing and takes him back to the castle. And as she's tending to his wounds, they get into an argument about who was at fault, showing that although he may be a beast, she will not allow him to speak to her however he wants, and she is capable of standing up for herself. 
in the 2014 live-action French film, Beauty and the Beast. This Belle was also frightened of the Beast, but she stood her ground from the very beginning, as she told the Beast to not enter her room, to stop giving her dresses, and that nothing would happen between them. Since although the Beast kept insisting on doing all these things, she was adamant on the fact that he might have her in prison there, but that didn't give him the right to do whatever he wanted, and she would not be silent and just let him do as he pleased. The fact that Saki's former boss would knowingly use Saki's work and pass it off as his own really reminded me of Disney's live-action film Cruella. Since the fashion icon known as the Baroness, she was known to the outside world as being this genius fashion icon who always came up with new and interesting ideas. Once Cruella herself starts working for the Baroness, she soon finds out that the Baroness has many fashion designers on her team. And whenever a fashion designer happens to create an outfit that she loves, she will then state that she has done it again. And she tells the public she's the one who came up with the idea for the dress, she's the one who came up with the design, she's the one who did everything. She never once gives credit to the true designers. The Apothecary Diaries is another comparison that comes to mind. Since although both Saki and Lady Lishu are part of the environment, they are not treated as equals since they are seen as inferior. Saki for being a human and Lady Lishu, since although Lady Lishu is considered a concubine, she is looked down upon by many people in the inner palace and even her own servants, simply because she is so young and she doesn't have a legitimate status among the other older concubines since she cannot be with the Emperor yet due to her young age. And due to these reasons, nobody takes her seriously, except for Mao Mao. Much like how although Saki is a part of the environment at her workplace, she isn't taken seriously at all by anybody, except for Atlas. Also the fact that the author let us know that it would be years before Saki would become a great secretary, that really reminded me of My Hero Academia, since Deku lets the audience know that he is the number one hero in the world, and what we're about to see from episode 1 and onwards is his retelling of the past up until present day when he's the number one hero. So in this sense, we're both spoiled in knowing their future. We don't know how they got there, but we do know that eventually, they both succeed in what they wanted to do. Now my next comparison could be seen as me reaching, but I honestly do feel that it fits. In the line of a manga anime film, Wolf Children, the man simply known as Wolfman was told by his parents to always hide his wolf half due to the stigma and prejudice and hate he would receive from others because he wasn't human. But it wasn't until after he met Hana that he found out this wasn't always the case. Since after he showed Hana his wolf form, instead of running away and being scared of him, she decided to stay with him and she doesn't care that he isn't fully human and that they might potentially get talked about if his secret is ever found out. Similar to how although Alice knows that Saki is human, and that of course this would mean that he would get talked about for making the decision to have such a inferior creature as his personal secretary working for him directly, he doesn't care, since he knows that she is far more than what other people think she is. They both saw potential in the other that they themselves could never see. Another character Saki reminds me of is Katara from Avatar The Last Airbender. Since Katara has to deal with sexism not only from her own brother, but also when she goes to the Northern Water Tribe to learn waterbending. Only to be told that in their tribe, women are not allowed to learn waterbending for combat, only for medicinal purposes. Katara does not take this news well, and goes as far as to challenge the waterbending master named Paku to a fight. And although he admits that she has great skills, he still says that he will not teach her because she's a girl. Just like how although Saki has great skills and is a great worker, her former male boss refused to acknowledge her work. Both of these female leads are seen as being weaker and inferior, yet they both share a temperament and self-confidence that doesn't allow themselves to actually feel inferior. They know they aren't, and they know that the males in their lives are just too stubborn to admit it. Both Leonhard and Atlas have intimidating auras, they care deeply about their female leads long before the female leads themselves realize that they have feelings for them, and they both look like lions and have fangs. Another thing that I do like about this volume is the fact that the author shows us how Alice could have been drawn, since at one point apparently there was a chance that Alice's fangs could have been facing down instead of up. That is one key difference between them, since His Majesty's fangs face down, similar to that of a saber-toothed tiger, while Alice's fangs remind me of mammoth tusk. So I do like the fact that they have this distinction, besides appearances and personality. <laughs> Since they're already both huge lion beastmen, if they were to both have their fangs facing the same direction, they would have just been too similar, at least to me. Especially given the fact that, so far, I have never really seen beastmen with their fangs facing up. I usually only ever see them with their fangs facing down. And as of right now, Alice has not been shown to have a human appearance, like most if not all speeding the beast male leads usually tend to have. And frankly, I'm so happy for that, since for so long, I have been wanting a series that has a beast man in it without the need for them to somehow be human. Not that I dislike or have an issue with the other beast men in other series having a human form, it's just seen so often that it's refreshing for me to see a series that as of right now, doesn't follow that trope. I was like, the gods have finally answered my prayers for a different type of Beauty and the Beast series. And coincidentally, I'm currently working on and off on a video where I mention this recurring theme of authors seemingly never having a series where the beast or alien lead stay in their original forms. They usually have them look human eventually. And it looks like in this series, Alice stays in his original form. 
Now before I continue to my last comparisons, here's a portion of the promotional CD audio video for this manga series. Since I figured you guys could use a break right about now. <laughs>人間の立場は弱い。それでも負けるかって抗い続けていたら呼び出された。大きい。サキさんですね。はい。アトラス社長に。大きいサキさん、あなたはずっと優秀でした。so in that video, at least to my ears, it sounded like Saki was voiced by Yuko Kaida, and Atlas was voiced by Satoshi Hino. Now the reason that this is relevant is because me thinking that Yuko Kaida could possibly be Saki's CD drama voice actress, and I say thinking because I can't read Japanese, so I don't know who's the actual voice actress, Yuko Kaida also voiced Isabella in the Promised Neverland series, and one could make a comparison between these two, since Isabella lives in a world similar to Saki's. Though of course Isabella's world is far more extreme. Since Isabella lives in a world where she's surrounded by beasts who will eat her if she does not do what they say. When she was young, she was given the choice either be eaten at that exact moment or become a mother. She made her choice and when she was older, she was artificially impregnated, gave birth to her child and was then sent off to one of various farms. And her job was to raise countless amounts of children whom she would one day send off to be eaten. Isabella did not allow this horrific reality to break her. She kept her resolve and did what she had to do in order to survive. They are in very hostile environments where the beasts use their superior abilities and fearsome natures to make them do what they want. And although this would break most anyone, neither Saki nor Isabella let their spirits be broken and they do not complain. They only do what is asked of them. And as for the voice actor Satoshi Hino, he has voiced both Lord Ainz Ulngon and King Leonhardt. And the fact that he, out of all the other possible voice actors, was chosen to specifically voice Atlas in this promotional video, it really made it seem to me like, one, it seems he's being typecast because he's voiced two previous fearsome creatures before, and two, that he is seen as the best fit to voice such characters. And although I love his voice acting as Lord Irons, and especially of King Leonhardt, I feel that if this were ever to get an anime series, that they pick somebody else to voice him. It's fine if it's just for the promotional CD video, but as the actual voice actor to voice him in the anime, I feel we should give somebody else a chance. One, for my own sake, because I don't want to keep hearing Lord Ainz and then King Leonhardt and then Atlas whenever I listen to any of their voices in their respective animes. And two, to maybe get somebody who isn't as well known in the voice acting world to voice such a man as Atlas and see what he can bring to the table. And I'm not saying that Satoshi wouldn't do a terrific job, I'm just saying that it would be nice to hear somebody different since I've already heard his voice, voice two fearsome creatures before. A third one would be a bit too much in my opinion. In Seton Academy, there's a lion that's named Babari Atlas, and he's a male Barbary lion, and just for those two reasons, I made the comparison because he's a lion and he's named Atlas, just like our main lead in this series. And now my final comparison is the most recent one that I became aware of. In the comic and indie animated series, Lackadaisy, the main male feline in charge, who is deceased, is named Atlas. He was mentioned and seen in a portrait in the first episode and recently made his first live physical appearance in the animated short Ingenue. He was a silent but imposing figure who was in charge of the entire operation they were running. But for once, this Atlas isn't a lion. He appears to be a tiger, which is a nice distinction. Currently, the only mythological comparison I have is Atlas's name. His name comes from the Greek titan Atlas. He was the leader of the Titans when he went to war with the Greek gods for who would rule Olympus. And when the Titans lost, the Greek god Zeus punished Atlas differently from the others. He made Atlas hold up the earth on his shoulders. This Atlas is said to come from the ancestral line, which is why he still retains his full beast appearance instead of just the legs features. Much like how the Greek Atlas has the title of a Titan, this Atlas has the title of a primordial being.